Okay, Jack, I'm going to hand it over to you to take it over on Revenge of the Chief Executives, Knoxville Mayors, part two. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, I forgot. I, I called it that. That's a, that's a, that's a good name for it. Um, it the uh, you, You'd think uh, our, our mayors would be uh, more familiar than they are. We went through a bunch of them uh, last time. We talked about mayors last month. And I suspect that most people have never heard of, of most of the people we talked about. And you'd think it would be more familiar to talk about more recent ones. Uh, and it probably will be. I think most people have heard, uh, if you're an adult who's lived in Oxford for a long time, you can probably name four or five or maybe even six mayors, but there have been uh, there have been 31 mayors in uh, Knoxville since uh, the, the early 20th century. Um, it's not like uh, it's not like presidents in our in our kind of collective memory. I think even if you talk to a 10 year old, they can name uh, about a dozen uh, presidents and they know the difference between Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, even though they uh, uh, haven't been around for uh, a, a very long time. But how many mayors uh, can even their parents uh, uh, think of? Uh, uh, anyway, this is, uh, uh, the, many people, people have named, things named for them. So I'm thinking that we probably should help be, do a better job of helping people know who, uh, who these people were that, that we honor with various buildings and other institutions. Um, uh, the people we're going to be talking about tonight, and I'm going to go through them very quickly because uh, there are 30, 30 of them. That allows about two minutes per, per mayor. Um, but uh, some had graduate degrees, some, some weren't even high school graduates. There's quite a variety there. Uh, there were mostly white males uh, with three uh, notable exceptions. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, only a, a few of them were not from Tennessee. And that's uh, a, an interesting theme. I wanna talk about some um, that uh, in the 19th century, many mayors of Knoxville were not from anywhere near here. In the 20th century, almost all of them with a few exceptions were from uh, Tennessee. Um, but we'll, we'll be emphasizing the ones who aren't as familiar. So that's why we're starting with the beginning and, and uh, we, we may run through the, the latter ones pretty quickly. But the first one we're talking about is a guy named Sam High School, who I think we uh, mentioned uh, briefly last time. He was our longest term mayor uh, of Knoxville before Victor Ash. He had four non-consecutive terms uh, over a period of 20 years or so. Uh, he was uh, mayor more often, more often than not. Um, he was uh, known for lots of things. He was a, considered a progressive. He considered himself a progressive, at least. He, he authored uh, public funding for lots of essentials for black people, uh, including uh, uh, public schools and mental health facilities and things like that, uh, that, that uh, had not been uh, well enough funded before. He opposed prohibition. Uh, and uh, he also was, uh, had the impression that prostitution was with us to stay. So he was the first and only mayor to establish a red light district in Knoxville. It was called Friendly Town. It was on the east side of, of, uh, of the old city area over on Florida Street, uh, which was uh, where, where Friendly Town was. It's only uh, an kind of industrial warehouse area now. Um, but he was also our most intellectual mayor. He wrote a book about uh, called Andrew Jackson and Early Tennessee History, a three volume uh, work of history a little over 100 years ago that is still cited today by historians today. It's really just a, a, a big a major piece of work. Uh, no mayor has ever in from Oslo has ever uh, created anything of this, uh, this size and scale and scope. Um, he, uh, as progressive, he favored a new, what was considered a progressive kind of government, which in retrospect may be less progressive than it seemed. Uh, for many years, we had had a, uh, a commissioner or, or a, a uh, count alderman type government with uh, with aldermen from each of several districts who were elected by popular vote to uh, to serve on uh, on city council or the board of aldermen it was called as it was called uh, but he favored a new kind of government run by not by just greenhorns people who didn't know what they were doing people who were just popular in their neighborhood but by uh, by commissioners who had already had a proven facility for finance or or uh, or understanding uh, road construction or things like this, you know, five com uh, commissioners uh, who would come together and be elected by the, by the, the people at, at, at large, uh, the city at large. So there were, there, beginning with the end of his uh, series of terms, there was no more city council, uh, but the representatives were elected from each district. There's kind of a, an irony with that, considering the fact that he had been a supporter of, of black causes, it, is that the commission government being having only five men uh, who were already 
proven uh, uh, experts in one thing or another. Uh, this was the end of black representation in city government, which is something we had had, unlike many other cities in America, we'd have black representation for about 50 or 60 years before uh, this all ended uh, in around 1912. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, the, it was kind of a, this commissioner style government was what, what we might call a technoc technocracy. And it was uh, interesting what happened to it. I, I, it might be worth us talking to self to go into that. There are a lot of changes in government over the years and I'm not gonna be talking about all the details of these things. I'm, talk I'm talking more about individuals and the personal stories of these mayors. Um, the uh, uh, a, a guy that was uh, elected uh, actually between uh, some of high school's terms was a guy named Joseph McTeer, uh, a very popular guy. He was a a combat veteran of the Confederate Army in the Civil War. Um, he was uh, uh, one of the battles he he fought in was uh, oh, oh oh these are a couple of things that uh, high school was known for uh, the uh, uh, the Market House and also um, uh, what was the other thing. Uh, uh, we had a picture, yeah, yeah. The uh, the uh, he was the mayor during the the era of the uh, uh, the expositions in uh, in at Chillahowie Park that brought so many people to town and was a supporter of that. Um, but uh, back to Joseph McTeer, uh, he was a uh, a a Civil War veteran, and as a Confederate at the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, he might have shot at another future uh, Knoxville mayor, uh, Marcus De Lafayette Bearden, who was a Union officer in that uh, in that battle and actually was grievously wounded in that in that battle a wound that may never have have perfectly healed and that was that his death in the 1880s was blamed on um but it's interesting that we had in knoxville we had uh we had representatives of both sides of the civil war who uh and, and much later were were uh, both serving as in very responsible positions and as mayor and in business uh, McTeer had a clothing store. He's best known for a clothing as a clothing merchant. Uh, most of his life uh, was uh, uh, he and his wife were were gracious hosts. His wife was known to Nassau as cousin Manda, and she had a, a signature drink that she served at their home called uh, the Blackberry Shrub. I would love to find the recipe for that. Uh, McTeer's uh, uh, service as mayor was rather short and disappointing. He uh, had uh, what was called prostatitis. It might have been prostate cancer, uh, but was uh, uh, was hoping to get treatment for this in New York and spent uh, about half of his term up in New York uh, seeking treatment, including uh, surgery for uh, on 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 his prostate. Um, he stayed at a place called the Hoffman House, which uh, a few years earlier had been associated with the Tweed Ring, uh, the famous uh, uh, Democratic Party machine of New York. Uh, and he died in the Hoffman House uh, in early 1904, uh, causing a bit of a crisis in city government uh, when we had to find quickly another mayor. Um, and uh, the guy that they found was an ally of, of McTeer's, a guy named John Paul Murphy, J.P. Murphy, who was uh, uh, technically uh, mayor uh, for only eight days. However, uh, during uh, McTeer's time in New York, he had been acting mayor for several months before that in, in the city. And he's also worth mentioning tonight because he was he had a, another longer term uh, fonder uh, nickname, and that was the mayor of Irishtown. Uh, John Paul Murphy was uh, was an Irishman and was a, a member, was was a very prominent figure in the Irish community uh, in the Irishtown area, which was mainly along Magnolia and Fifth Avenue area today. Uh, they were all uh, Irish Catholics who lived there, and, and, uh, and uh, Murphy was, I guess, our second uh, Catholic mayor. Uh, he was a, a fascinating sounding guy. He was a printer by trade, but he spoke, he was fluent in Gaelic. How many people do you know who speak Gaelic? Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, Murphy was was one of them. But our after Murphy, he was uh, just such a well-known guy. Every time an Irish person died and was buried uh, anywhere, uh, uh, Murphy would show up for the funeral. And he was just a, this this guy who was everybody's pal. Uh, we, might, we might think of him as a ward healer or something like that from the time, but but was, uh, was a popular guy with, among both uh, the Irish Catholics and, uh, and the mainstream uh, Protestants of, of, of Knoxville during his, his era. Uh, he was followed by uh, a guy that may be the most mysterious mayor of the 20th century. Uh, I think without question he is. He's, uh, 
His name is William H. Gass. Um, uh, and uh, he was, uh, we don't have either a, an, an absolute birth or a death date for him. It's interesting uh, being that he was a, a 20th century mayor and once very prominent uh, that we know so little about his early and later lives. Um, he was probably from Greene County. Uh, he married a, a, a well-known young woman named uh, uh, Annie, uh, who was the daughter of Leonidas Hoke, who was one of the most po powerful congressmen of the 1880s and 90s. Leonidas Hoke, who died under very mysterious circumstances after uh, uh, swilling a, a glass of arsenic in a downtown pharmacy. Um, some people thought it was suicide. Some thought it was a murder, uh, an assassination. Uh, he was a very powerful fellow, um, and there were he had lots of enemies. Uh, but we really don't know very much about that. But anyway, uh, Gas married his daughter, um, and uh, was a, a prominent banker. That was his main trade. Uh, he was involved in several businesses, but he was a banker. He was president of the Knoxville Bank and Trust. Um, which uh, in the early uh, 1900s built a, a very large building on Gay Street, uh, we know as the Burwell Building. Well, uh, he was just thinking about building this building uh, for his bank early on when he uh, unexpectedly got the word that Mayor McTeer had died and would he be willing to run for mayor and, uh, and take this job. And uh, he was not uh, an obvious contender for mayor at the time. Uh, he was well known in certain circles, but not not that well known. Uh, but he said, uh, "Okay, I wouldn't. It's not something I'd want to do, but I'll I'll do it if the people need me to do it." Uh, he um, he uh, was was mayor uh, at the time when they were building our two big uh, railroad stations in town. Uh, the, both the Southern and the L and N were built during his time as mayor, and. Uh, Part of the problem with building the L and N station was they had to do something about Clinch Avenue. Clinch Avenue ran across. We, we couldn't have a, a street running right across uh, the, the the train yards, so it was up to the city to figure out, in cooperation with the L and N, a way to uh, to build a viaduct over uh, the uh, the rail yards. And uh, this was the Clinch Avenue viaduct, uh, the the original piers of which are still there today. But this is the Clinch Avenue Viaduct as it as it appeared in its in its earliest days. Uh, Mayor Gass's uh, uh, daughter, who was I think her name was Mary 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 Lee, uh, was uh, was the was only six years old. But she was given the honor of driving the first horse and carriage across the new Clinch Avenue Viaduct in 1906 or so. Um, but um, anyway, he was uh, he was. Uh, Pretty prominent. He he got out. Of, he he left the mayor's office. Didn't uh, got out of politics. Went back to banking. Back in the Burwell building, uh, when he was uh, president of that of that magnificent building, which was one of the tallest buildings in Knoxville at the time, um, and uh, he got in some trouble about 1912 at that bank uh, because the bank was failing, and he kept uh, making loans, uh, just trying uh, hustling to try to. Uh, to, uh, to do what he could to save it, but he, he crossed several boundaries and broke some laws in doing so. Uh, this, you might remember this, something similar happened uh, about uh, 70 years later uh, with, uh, with the Butcher Brothers. But he, uh, he was convicted of bank fraud in 1914 and sentenced to three years in prison. Uh, he appealed this sentence, but we don't, I, I haven't figured out what came of him after that. He just disappears completely from Knoxville roles. He's never mentioned in the Knoxville newspapers again, even though he had been mayor, even though he had been a bank president. Uh, uh, Gas is, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, destined to be, to be uh, a mystery to us. By the way, his home uh, was on the corner of Cumberland Avenue and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Walnut Street. It was a rather large house, and it was uh, after they left uh, rather suddenly and um, ignominiously, uh, he and his wife left uh, there, the home was, cre uh, was converted into something that was called the Lyceum, uh, which uh, Laura still talked about a few weeks ago. The Lyceum was uh, a, a kind of a cultural center uh, run by mostly by women. Uh, we had an art museum, uh, had uh, a meeting hall, and the, at the Lyceum was where the suffrage was notably celebrated uh, in 1920, uh, the, the victory in the, in the state legislature that led to uh, that 
same day to the national victory of suffrage, uh, what what assured the passage of the uh, of the Nineteenth Amendment was uh, was celebrated in that uh, in that uh, in that building, um, which had been the the Gass's home. Um, well, Gass with uh, uh, the first mayor after Gass was a guy named John McMillan Brooks. Uh, he was. Uh, Another uh, Confederate soldier before the war, even as a as a young man, he had he had started UT's military department. Uh, he was very badly wounded at Chickamauga. Uh, got it, was out of the war after that. Uh, began uh, uh, a career in insurance. Uh, he, uh, he uh, came to Knoxville and married uh, Sophia Park, whose father had been had been there. Um, he was a uh, uh, developer of. Uh, uh, became a, 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 an inter, a, a investor in Middlesboro, which was a, a we think of it as just a town in Kentucky now. But Middlesboro was a major effort to try to make a kind of industrial paradise, uh, a, a place where people from around the country, even around the world, would would come and and, and build their factories. Uh, Middlesboro, Kentucky, was just uh, the perfect place for for your industry. Uh, and it was uh, his, uh, the guy that did this was a guy named Alexander Arthur, who was from uh, Scotland, I believe, but was, uh, but was uh, in charge of the whole thing. Uh, and Macmillan was kind of an ally of his. Macmillan early on was up in Middlesboro so much and so much trusted that he was elected uh, mayor of Middlesboro, uh, Kentucky. Um, but, uh, but he came uh, back to, uh, to Knoxville uh, and, and as, a, as an older man in his late 60s. Uh, he was elected uh, mayor of Knoxville, so he's the only Knoxville mayor who's ever been mayor of another of another city uh, before he became mayor of Knoxville. Um, it was during his time. Uh, there are a few things that uh, that he he did uh, that we we can remember today. One one is the the city erected the uh, John Mason Boyd uh, Memorial on uh, the courthouse lawn. Uh, it says John Mason Boyd, our beloved physician, on the corner of Gay and uh, Cumberland Avenue. Uh, that's on the left there, and they the city also began building back when the school system was a city project, began building uh, the big Knoxville High School on uh, Fifth Avenue, which is still uh, there as a building today and uh, is now a uh, a, a residential uh, community for 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 older older Knoxvillians. But uh, anyway, but he also constructed uh, a green school, the school for black children, which is uh, is now of course a biracial school. But it's now still there. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, it, interesting distinction. A guy that was mayor of two different cities at different times in his life. There's another guy whose career kind of echoes that a little bit later in the in the program. Uh, next, uh, speaking of uh, people associated with schools, is a guy named Sam E. Hill. A lot of people have heard of Sam E. Hill School. Um, but he was uh, been county superintendent of schools uh, and and had, had led the establishment of Central High School. This is back when we had two, two school systems, one in the city, one in the county. And if you lived outside of the city in Knox County uh, and wanted to go to public high school, uh, you, you, you couldn't do that until they opened Central High. And Sammy Hill was one of the people who got that uh, going. Um, he was mayor uh, uh, just briefly uh, of, of Knoxville. He, he uh, apologized sort of that he, he preferred uh, he didn't like the city very much. He, he preferred life in the country. He said in Knoxville, they live like rats. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but Sammy Hill School, uh, uh, originally for black children, was is, na is named for him. Uh, uh, next uh, mayor is a, a guy named John E. McMillan, who had a complicated uh, career in life. Um, he was a banker and accountant by, by trade, probably the best uh, uh, fiscally trained mayor uh, that we've ever had beforehand. He knew numbers much better than uh than than your average mayor um he he uh he was a, he was he was a, a, a trained accountant uh he worked first as city comptroller uh he worked for several years as, as county court clerk um and he was on um, uh, uh the, the uh, city commission uh but he he uh was uh at the time that uh, that he was mayor, uh, mayors were not as powerful as they had been before in city commission. These five experts were making a lot of the the, uh, the the recommendations, and he was really kind of signing off on them. But a lot of big things happened while McMillan was mayor. One, the city had one of the biggest annexations of its entire history to this day 
1917 when we brought in South Knoxville. South Knoxville had never been considered part of Knoxville until 1917. South Knoxville plus parts of East, North, and West uh, Knoxville that are familiar and, and some kind of close today uh, were added to the city in, uh, in 1917. And, uh, and, and suddenly there were, there were 78,000 people living here. The city roughly doubled its population uh, during uh, the time that he was uh, overseeing things. Uh, he also took on the biggest, uh, what was the biggest project, uh, public project in the city's history to that date. And that was the construction of the Gay Street Viaduct, which was a very complicated project. Uh, cost a lot of a lot of money they built that during uh, world war world war one um, and it was finished in 1919 uh, but he also you know saw the city through the the, uh, the that war uh, uh, saw all the soldiers leave leave on the trains uh, he was the mayor at the time and something to remember him now is that he was mayor at the time of the Spanish flu in 1919 interestingly one one thing that mayors might be grateful for the city commission government was that they weren't really expected to do anything special. It was a city physician uh, that took over, as the experts took over things in this kind of technocracy. And uh, the city physician was the guy who called all the shots and people got angry at the city physician, not at the mayor when he closed the churches and the, and the, and the Tennessee Valley Fair and the, and the dance halls and, and, uh, and everything else. Um, and, and came up with all these rules that you could have only more, only, only two people uh, at, at a time together. They had uh, groups of more than two were banned during this time. But uh, none of this was blamed on McMillan because this was a commissioned government and he was just kind of the, the, the superintendent of it. Um, but, but then uh, something that they, people I think maybe did blame on him was the 1919 riot. And he had a really complicated relationship with this. He was mayor of the city at the time that it happened, the uh, time this lynch mob uh, rampaged down uh, Gay Street and laid siege uh, with, with the help of the confused uh, 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 National Guard soldiers who showed up uh, with machine guns, uh, laid siege to the black community. Uh, this was uh, the red summer, uh, very end of the summer here when it happened. Um, but his, uh, he was not only mayor and, uh, and, and, and you could say allowed it to be happened, could have done something more than he did, but he was also widely believed, rumored at the time, and historians today believe it to be true that he was the illegitimate father of Maurice Mays, the young man who had been arrested for murder and whose uh, arrest was what, uh, was what touched off the riot. Um, uh, when they, they were trying to uh, lynch him and they weren't allowed to. Uh, this was, uh, anyway, it, it seems to have gotten around uh, that this is likely. Um, I, I've always uh, assumed uh, that John McMillan being kind of a big shot in the city may have taken advantage of a, of a, of a black woman but I did some math and realized that he was just a teenager when uh, when Maurice Mays was born. So this uh, this is a, a child that he fathered at the age of 16 or so. And McMillan actually tried to help support in his later years. Uh, Maurice Mays, of course, was uh, was was uh, was was arrested, convicted and executed for the crime. Many people think that this was a miscarriage of justice, that he was uh, that there's very little evidence against him. Um, he was executed for the crime in 1922, and four years later, um, uh, John McMillan died suddenly. He's our, first, our only mayor that I know of to uh, have committed suicide. Uh, that, was, uh, that happened in 1926 in his Fifth Avenue townhouse. Um, uh, but anyway, it's a, 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 a sad and complicated story, and a guy that, that uh, we really don't, uh, we, 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 we should it would bear some more study, I believe. I'll just put it that way. Um, but hey, Jack, uh, anyway, yeah. Can I interrupt? Uh, There's a question from Jerry Ledbetter on the chat about about um, elections of mayors. Was it much different back then in the early 20th century than it is today? How mayors were elected? Yes. Uh, by this time, uh, there there we went through several twists and turns in how we elected mayors. By the time of John McMillan, uh, I believe the the most of the first half of the 20th century, um, uh, mayors had once been elected uh, 
uh, individually, but but by we went back to this idea of mayors being the city councilman that gets the most votes, basically, is what it it it, it was. And uh, this was uh, this was the rule through the through the 20s, 30s, 40s. And then we went back to the strong mayor, the idea of, of uh, electing a mayor individually. So, uh, uh, but this was still the commission uh, style of government, which was a little bit different from that. And to be honest, when we did the book a year ago, I figured it all out. And I, right now I'm not remembering exactly how, uh, how McMillan, uh, I, I actually think that they were, we were electing mayors individually during the commission uh, era. So, which was soon to end. Um, but uh, anyway, that's a, that's a good question that I, I uh, um, uh, that, that, that has a complicated answer. I'll, 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 uh, we, we should have a, maybe a, a talk about city government in general and, and get into those, those uh, complexities sometime. But uh, all right, uh, the mayor that, that beat uh, uh, McMillan was a guy named E.W. Neal, Ernest Wesley Neal. Uh, he was from Ohio. Um, he was one of the relatively few mayors in the 20th century who was not from Tennessee. Uh, he was a grocery wholesaler and uh, learned to be a, became a, a well-known Knoxville booster kind of in the late Victorian era. Uh, and he, uh, in 1919, uh, was the first mayor elected with female voters. This is a, a little uh, uh, brief chapter that a lot of people don't know about is that women could vote in Tennessee before the 19th Amendment, uh, the year before, uh, only that year uh, before, uh, but only for uh, city, uh, city government roles and also for, um, I, I, I think uh, for president, but not for, for Congress for some reason. Uh, but this was, uh, this was the, uh, women could vote in Knoxville in 1919 and did in the fall of 1919, right after the big riots and, uh, and, uh, and elected this guy who was not considered to have a great chance of beating uh, McMillan who had been fairly popular before the riot, uh, but he did, uh, he did uh, edge out uh, McMillan and became uh, mayor. Uh, Neil himself became controversial. I was interested in looking into the researching the, the Christmas season in 1920 that he was the subject of a major recall effort. Uh, there were mass meetings. We, we like to think of people in the deep past getting, getting along better than we do now, but there were mass meetings on Market Square to try to depose uh, uh, Mayor Neal uh, because there were various uh, complaints about him uh, uh, abusing his, his, his office, uh, about, uh, about making, uh, putting his friends and family, uh, finding uh, jobs for them, uh, a bit of nepotism, and also even having city funds go to buy groceries from his stores. Uh, also, he had a reputation a bit as, a, as an elitist. Um, he was uh, one of the one of his more controversial moves was to build a new use study funds to build a new boulevard in the in the suburbs. So this boulevard that would be called Cherokee Boulevard. Uh, he he uh, he was the guy that decided that city funds were were merited to build this this boulevard out in the country at that time when a lot of city roads were in terrible shape and needed to be paved. Uh, city roads where, where poorer people lived were going, uh, uh, were going neglected when, and when he built the, the Cherry Boulevard. I mean, to his, to, to his credit though, if you look at today, uh, Cherry Boulevard is where very wealthy people live, but it's also one of the most public uh, residential streets in, in Knoxville. I would say hundreds of people go there to jog or put in boats, or 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 just to go down and and uh, and and throw a frisbee for a dog uh, down along Cherry Boulevard, and and uh, and that might have been Neil's idea. He also had an interesting idea that uh, that the this is the era of the Dixie Highway was coming through, and uh, Neil had a very pragmatic idea for this. This was a national, major national highway. Millions of dollars were being made to fund it to improve it all through all the places it needed to go. The Dixie Highway, which went from uh, upper Midwest down to down to uh, Florida, um, that uh, it was going to come right through Knoxville, and it was going to come down, uh, going to come to downtown, and then go out west before going south again. And uh, a lot of people thought, "Gosh, this is great! People can see how wonderful Kingston Pike is." Kingston Pike was considered this beautiful uh, avenue. Uh, it was a lot of old houses with tree-lined yard, uh, 
tree lined yards uh, close to town and you had a river view and you had the university, all these things. Uh, and then beyond that, it was just beautiful farmland. Uh, and people thought, go gonna have the best image of Knoxville uh, that they could possibly have if they arrive uh, by Kingston Pike. Well, Neil had this idea, well, Kingston Pike already looks nice. Sutherland Avenue's uh, in terrible shape. Let's, let's force the highway over to Sutherland Avenue and, and, and get the highway funds to improve Sutherland Avenue uh, for us. Uh, Sutherland Avenue, which really just went by some factories and things uh, that, uh, that people, uh, uh, and, and people didn't, want, didn't really want people to see at the time. Um, but uh, anyway, he didn't get his way in that regard. And, and, uh, and the Dixie Highway did go down uh, Kingston Pike and actually turn Kingston Pike from a beautiful place to, uh, to, uh, to what it is uh, today. Um, but anyway, he was he he decided uh, 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 politics was not for him and and uh, was was done with it at, by the time he was uh, he was finished uh, in office in 1923. Um, ben Morton is one of the better known, more more powerful, more influential figures of this era. Uh, a, uh, a kind of a, a Republican progressive uh, in some ways. He was from Blount County originally. Uh, was kind of a Horatio Alger story, worked all his way up from the very bottom, like an, an assistant clerk uh, role to, to the top at H.C. Hackney, the, the grocery wholesaler that's still around today. Uh, but he also had interest in banking and, and uh, he, was, he was really interested in automobiles and, and actually was owned a couple of automobile uh, dealerships. Uh, he knew that this was a big wave of the future. Most people didn't have cars yet and Morton wanted to, to, to try to get more people to have cars. Um, but he was uh, uh, Neil had been had been trying to raise taxes to build more and more roads uh, because he knew cars were coming too. So this was uh, automobiles were a big part of uh, what was on the minds of mayors at this time. Uh, but he also, uh, as uh, as a lot of you know, uh, 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 people who had automobiles in those early days were really interested in a new project to the south called the Smoky Great Smoky Mountains a National Park project. This was something that you could get to mainly by automobile, and uh, it was it was the car club, the Knoxville Automobile Club, that was was involved in this. And uh, Morton himself became a, a major leader of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park movement. Uh, there's a, a a place in the mountains named in his honor, Morton Overlook. Um, but he was a, a progressive and in and uh, in, in favor of the uh, the city manager uh, form of government with a uh, with a with a with a mayor, but also a city manager uh, that, that you would bring in, a guy that knew how to run things, uh, the guy, a guy that would come up with policies and the mayor would just kind of uh, sign off on them. Um, but uh, this began brewing during, uh, during Morton's time. Um, during Morton's time, they, uh, they, they built uh, one thing that we see today that people, anybody that goes down the river notices and people who drive to the east of downtown uh, the uh, Riverside uh, Drive uh, water plant. Uh, uh, I think it's called the, is it called the, the Walter Whitaker water plant. Uh, big, most beautiful water plant ever built in, in Tennessee that I know of. It's still there and still a, a lovely big um, kind of marble faced building. Um, but also during his time, uh, the city moved into the uh, Tennessee School for the Deaf building and uh, the city hall had always been downtown on Market Square before that uh, from 1868 until until Morton's time and and Morton realized they needed a much bigger building. Tennessee School for the Deaf was moving to South Knoxville so they said gosh that looks like a city hall why don't we move into it and that's that's when the Tennessee School for the Deaf building became became city hall um, but that was uh, that, that all happened during during Morton's time. Uh, do you have a picture of the city hall um, building? Yeah, that's it. And, and that, the building that's today, the uh, Lincoln Memorial University Law School, is, uh, was City Hall from Morton's time up until the, the late 1970s. Um, but that was uh, one, of, one, of his, uh, one of his many uh, improvements to the city. Um, his successor was a guy named James Fowler, who uh, I've, I've suggested maybe, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, without question, was the best connected mayor in Knoxville history uh, from the very beginning. Uh, he was famous, in fact, before he was mayor. He was a, a, a lawyer. Uh, a, a, by the time he was 35, he was the Republican nominee for governor. Um, it, it, that's back in the late 1800s. 
He was uh, he was assistant U.S. attorney general. Uh, he was solicitor general. Uh, he was sometimes in the national news because he would be quoted about uh, about things in the national news because because of his 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 role in in Washington. He knew lots of Republican uh, presidents: uh, McKinley, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, uh, Harding, Coolidge. Uh, he was uh, known as a trust buster, uh, uh, inspired by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, but he ran for uh, kind of surprised people after this this national profile surprised some people when in his in in, in his mid sixties he ran for mayor of uh, of his uh, or ran for city council actually in his mid sixties he won and and soon became uh, mayor um, he was uh, the uh, launched something called the city planning commission which uh, was looking more into kind of a, a an idea of uh, more thoughtful planning. He was working by this time working with the city manager, uh, and uh, was uh, was was the guy that uh, that anointed Knoxville's first airport, uh, the, the airport that was on Sullivan Avenue, became known as McGee Tyson Airport, and that was officially the port of Knoxville. Um, but uh, this was the very first. Uh, it doesn't look like much there, but that was what that's the uh, port airport as it was in uh in uh in the 1920s when it was first called mcgee tyson airport after uh young e. tyson who was killed in uh in, in world war one um uh several years before it moved to uh, blunt county also with uh, mayoral uh, initiatives um but uh but he was a uh, even while he was mayor he became republican nominee for the senate and uh and it, it's interesting that that uh, people were wondering whether he could be senator and mayor at the same time. Uh, he uh, didn't uh, have to deal with that because he, he got 40% of the vote, though. That was pretty significant, uh, pretty significant uh, uh, second second uh, uh, second running place there. But but he uh, was uh, had just an amazing life and his long life that he connect he connects the the Civil War. He was born actually during the Civil War. Uh, but died in the in the television era, the nuclear era, at age uh, at age 92. Uh, just had a, a very very long life. In later years, I love this story that in later years he he loved to garden so much, and his he had a house on North Broadway back when that was a stylish place to live. He had a house on North Broadway and uh, and uh, did did all his gardening, and he was he wore a straw hat, and some people actually mistook him for a for 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 the gardener rather than the uh, rather than the resident, but I think he was proud of that. Um, all right, the next one we'll talk about is a guy named James Trent, um, who has a, kind of shows uh, how these people weren't either liberal or conservative. They were combinations of both, and they're all complicated people in all in different ways that made them, uh, that gave them reason to, uh, to get, up, you know, get up, upset with each other, but not over the usual uh, kind of party lines we think about. Um, he was pro-labor. He was a, a big champion of, of, of labor rights, but he was skeptical of women's rights. Um, he, uh, he had a famous debate with uh, Mary Utopia Rothrock, the librarian, on the, uh, about the right to work on top of the Andrew Johnson Hotel building, which was brand new then. Uh, he uh, was, was mayor for a fairly short time, uh, later started a paper called, he, when he lost it, his reelection, he, he uh, and see if this rings a bell. He was uh, he he said, well, the whole thing's rigged, uh, and I think the the uh, it, it, the newspapers and and the media are are railroading me uh, in in a certain direction, and uh, and he he uh, he said it's all a racket. He said, and he started a paper called the Racketeer, to show uh, his contempt for uh, for the fact that he thought all the politics in Knoxville were rigged. He ran for office several times after that and uh, didn't ever win anything. He uh, got in a couple of fights. Uh, Alfred, Alfred Sanford, uh, the, the prominent industrialist, the guy that built the Sanford Arboretum off of Kingston Pike, uh, kind of a famous thing that's now gone, actually assaulted him over an insult to his wife uh, in the Prior Brown garage, the same Prior Brown garage we're trying to, we're trying to save today. Uh, he he tried to remain in politics, but didn't get very far. He also became an enemy of George Dempster, who had been his ally uh, early on, um, and uh, and uh, uh, tried to unseat him as as mayor. 
Uh, but he was he was mayor at the time that we began building the Henley Street Bridge, uh, which was officially named the George Dempster Bridge for all the work George Dempster had done. As at this time by by this time he was city manager. George Dempster was. We'll, we'll talk about him him more. You see, Henley was this a postcard. That's that's the postcard's misspelling of Henley, not not ours. But uh, but that's uh, that was a, a wonder to behold, and and some architects say it still is. It's a pretty bridge uh, uh, there that was built. Uh, it began in construction during uh, during during uh, Trent's time. Um, uh, John Thomas O'Connor uh, is uh, is a well known uh, uh, guy in Knoxville history. Was uh, mayor from thirty one to thirty five. Was uh, first known, uh, and he was. I mentioned Irish Town earlier, where J.P. Murphy was well known. He was first known there in Irish Town back in the eighteen eighties. Uh, or actually 1890s as a as a boxer. Uh, he was called Punch O'Connor in his early days. He became a uh, a, a, a a labor organizer uh, and and uh, worked in, in uh, machine shops in those days. Was a labor organizer. Later became president of the Tennessee Federation of Labor uh, for 10 years. Was uh, prominent statewide. He was self-taught. Uh, he he. Uh, eventually became a, an insurance man and then a banker without a, without a, having gone to college. Um, worked uh, for federal relief for the unemployed during the depression uh, was uh, and tried to uh, connect with uh, TVA intensive value authority was was brand new when he was mayor uh, and started in 1933 and uh, tried to see what you know, was the, the home of it but what can how can Nassau profit from from this amazing new uh, federal agency. He ran for Congress in 1936, and uh, this is, takes a lot of uh, uh, food spa for a, a Democrat in, in any any uh, election, because we have not had a uh, Democrat uh, in Congress from the second district of Tennessee since before the Civil War. But no one has come closer to it than Mayor Dempster. He was actually projected to win until the returns came in from Scott County and uh and and made it clear that he was not going to uh not going to make it this time um he uh uh had finished his mayoral term by the time he, he actually I, I guess missed it because he, he ran for city council and then and served in city council again in the 1950s um he and he was uh, around to uh to see a, a building named for him the john t o'connor senior citizen center was named in 1960 and by that time he was a Senior citizen himself, and and enjoyed the honor. I'm I'm grateful to him, by the way, for being elected when he was, because when he was elected, suddenly Knox uh, was curious about Irish Town, this place he'd come from, and all, a lot of the best uh, de descriptions, detailed descriptions about about what Irish Town was, come from the the time when he was first mayor, and they they said, "What do you mean Irish Town?" and and the, the newspaper reporters would interview people who remembered Irish Town as it was in the 1870s and 80s. And nineties, and, uh, and and talk about this place that was kind of like a separate, you know, a separate culture, a separate community, just so close to downtown. Um, but um, a very interesting fellow. All right, um, James Elmore is uh, next. He was uh, uh, rather uh, mayor rather briefly uh, during the uh, depression. Uh, he was the one who greeted Roosevelt when uh, Roosevelt came and paraded down Gay Street, uh, mainly I think to connect with uh, with TVA. Um, he uh, he didn't do very much. He declined to run for another term. Um, he uh, he uh, uh, and I, I just point out this interesting detail. He he died uh, in 1938 while listening to a to a Vols game, a, a, actually a victory for the Vols, but. At some tense moments, he had a heart attack though listening to this game on the on the radio, um, and we, we we don't have a lot to say about him. Except, but he he was not the last mayor, James Elmore. He'll another one will come up again. Uh, who was uh, did a bit more again by this time. This uh, the mayor was just the city councilman that got the most votes. He was kind of uh, the first among equals to some extent in city council. Uh, but uh, but uh, Elmore was mayor at the time they uh, they opened uh, the uh, the new airport uh, and this was the Knoxville Airport Knoxville Municipal Airport um, but it's in Blount County it's uh, they it's the closest place they could find this much flat area that was not developed uh, to uh, to build an airport and and it remains the the Knoxville Airport and connect it has 
uh, I, I think some supervision from city government to this day. Um, but uh, all right, uh, Judd Minot, W.W. Minot uh, was, uh, had been city manager of Knoxville first and it was a guy that kind of spearheaded the airport idea um, uh, along with, uh, with, uh, with Elmore. Um, he was uh, uh, mayor in uh, 1938, uh, and he finally did do something that uh, O'Connor and, and, and other people had got the ball rolling to try to get Knoxville under TVA power. This wasn't automatic. TVA wasn't automatically providing power to everybody in the, in the grand region. People always, all had to figure out how it was going to work. And that didn't happen until 1938 and happened uh, during, uh, during uh, Minot's uh, uh, time. Um, this, uh, he helped uh, found, uh, essentially helped found what we know as KUB today. Um, he became city manager again uh, uh, in the 1940s and uh, ran for a mayor again later on, but lo lost to a grocer uh, uh, named Kaz Walker. Uh, but uh, Minot uh, apparently was, uh, was kind of disgusted with how things were going and Knoxville moved to, uh, moved to Gatlinburg and became the city manager there. Uh, so this was uh, an interesting case like the guy from, who was mayor of Middlesbrough. Uh, Minot uh, became city manager of Knoxville, mayor of Knoxville, city manager again, and then city manager of Gatlinburg at, at a time when Gatlinburg was really just uh, coming into its own in the 1950s and 60s. It was doubling in size, doubled in size literally during uh, Minot's time as, uh, as city manager. All right, next one is a guy named Fred Allen. Uh, and if anybody's uh, uh, any older than me, they remember that there was a, a radio uh, personality named Fred Allen uh, a long time ago uh, that, uh, that, that, that actually got more attention than, than Mayor Fred Allen in Knoxville. Fred Allen was from Opelika, Alabama. He came to Knoxville as an agent for Standard Oil uh, early, very early in the century, around the turn of the century. Uh, he served on city council, then became mayor uh, during his time. He was uh, known for instituting some, some tighter uh, controls on air pollution, which they called smoke abatement in those days. Uh, he started the ball uh, uh, rolling to move Knoxville from central to eastern time. Uh, you may, some people know that, uh, that Knoxville was once on central time and in the 1940s uh, switched over to eastern, which seems only natural because we have eastern to the north and south of us, uh, but Allen kind of got that going. Uh, it was, of course, uh, at the very beginning of the war, he, he uh, knew war was coming and he started uh, civil defense committees and organizations. Um, and, uh, and, and he sometimes joked that, uh, and, and this was true, I actually checked on in the newspapers, uh, Fred Allen, the uh, radio comic, uh, even when Fred Allen was mayor of Knoxville, Fred Allen, the radio comic got more print in the Knoxville papers than, than Mayor Fred Allen did. Of course, at this there's a period of the, of the kind of the weak government, weak mayor uh, uh, period, and didn't wasn't able to do a whole lot. But he left office at 75, was Knoxville's oldest mayor, uh, and to be to be actually in office at at, uh, at, at that age. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, but he's interesting in part because he was the last uh, non-Tennessee native for 70 years. It was not until Madeline O'Hara that we had another mayor who's not from Tennessee. All right, this is the, uh, the famous uh, uh, dedication picture of Franklin Roosevelt at uh, Newfound Gap in 1940. And, uh, and uh, uh, Fred Allen was, was there uh, to represent Knoxville uh, with, with, the guy, with the president uh, on, that, uh, on that very uh, uh, famous day. No, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, all right, we have another Fred following uh, Fred Allen. His name is Fred Stair. He was a lumber dealer, uh, was very prominent in the Red Cross locally, and uh, the Tennessee Valley Fair. He was one of the uh, one of the, the head guys there for a good good long while. Um, was on the uh, interested, in, especially interested in education. He was on the Knoxville Board of Education back again during the city school era. And started something called Stair Tech, which was a uh, a technical school, a kind of a, 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 a vocational sort of a school uh, that was part of the public school system. Uh, Stair Tech was originally, by the way, in uh, in the city hall complex, uh, right here on the on the same hill where Paul and I are sitting tonight. Uh, Old Gallows Hill or Summit Hill uh, is uh, is is where where LMU campus is, and that's where Stair Tech was. Um, uh, but he was uh, was was 
uh, mayor for a, a, just a just a term uh, was uh, uh, during during the war, and I think his mayor world period was preoccupied with with uh, preparations uh, for uh, for the war and, uh, and and making things easy, raising money for the war effort and that sort of thing. Uh, Fred Sarah, by the way, is the only uh, the first one of these that I, I ever met in person. He was uh, he was an, an old, very old man when I was a kid. Lived across the street from my grandparents on on Sherwood Drive, but a ni nice old fellow in a dark suit. I don't remember him very very much otherwise. But, but uh, all right, E. E. Patton. I want to be sure to be able to to mention Erastus Eugene Patton because he was kind of a public historian. Uh, was interested in Knoxville history and history in general. He was from Carter County originally. He was a teacher, a principal, uh, probably the only person who has served as both principal of Knoxville High in the city school system and of, uh, of Central High in the county school system. Um, in not, not at the same time, but in succession, of course. Um, but he was, he was a public historian, uh, often spoke about history uh, locally to uh, luncheon groups and so forth. I spoke about the legacy of Andrew Johnson at the Tennessee Theater for the premiere of a Van Hef Heflin movie called Tennessee Johnson, which was attended by actual descendants of, of, of Andrew Johnson. Uh, but uh, but uh, anyway, it's a, uh, that must be intimidating to, to talk about uh, Johnson, who had a checkered girl at best with his, uh, with his granddaughter in the, in the audience. Um, but uh, later on, he just served for, a, a, as you see, a, a fairly short time at the end of the war, just as people were finding out what was going on over at Oak Ridge. A, a dramatic time, certainly, but uh, not, not a time when a mayor had a lot of, a lot of say over what, was, what people were paying attention to. All right, he was succeeded uh, kind of uh, by a surprise uh, uh, contender, uh, a, a popular city councilman, but uh, he got the most votes uh, in 1946 and became mayor of Knoxville. Um, he was uh, he was from Sevier County. Uh, uh, some some mayors didn't get past high school. He didn't go to high school. He was not even a, a, he used to brag that he had a fourth grade education. Uh, he'd been a coal miner, uh, he, but he came to Knoxville as a grocer in the 1920s uh, and, and started a whole chain of groceries. He was a radio personality. He was a populist politician. I won't go into great detail. Of course, there's a lot to say about Kaz Walker. Uh, we already had a, an all Kaz Walker show about uh, three months ago. But uh, as mayor, he tried to, uh, he, he hated the, uh, the, the elitism that he saw in Knoxville and, and uh, the, the, the silk stocking crowd, as he called them. I think he had good cotton socks, but, uh, but he, he fired the, uh, the elite uh, city manager, whose name was Paul Morton. Um, and uh, this was uh, incensed a lot of people because Morton seemed to be doing a good job and was trained to do the job he was doing. Um, and uh, there was a big recall effort. Uh, there was supported by the New Sentinel, but uh, the Knoxville Journal strongly supported Kaz Walker. Um, but this was, uh, this, uh, seemed to be a, a close race until, uh, uh, some word began leaking out in the, in the fall about things Kaz Walker had been saying in other cities about how easy it was to hoodwink, uh, the, uh, Knoxville voter, uh, that he, that he talked about all the tricks he'd done to, to, uh, maintain his popularity in, in Knoxville, uh, that, uh, that he, he did lose the race and was recalled from office, um, uh, uh, but, uh, but he, he went back to city council and he uh, stayed in city council over 30 years. He's the longest term city councilman in Knoxville history, uh, was still there until 1971. And he was also the oldest uh, lived mayor, the mayor to have survived the longest. He was, he was 96 when he died uh, back in the late 1990s. But uh, anyway, an interesting fellow, a lot more to say about him. We have a book about him that you can, that you can uh, buy from us or read at the library about uh, about oral histories of Kaz Walker. Um, but uh, he was replaced uh, by a guy, kind of an emergency fill-in candidate, uh, Edward uh, Chavans. Um, uh, Chavans was from a French Swiss family, a uh, uh, very interesting family. His uncle Albert was a noted uh, uh, radical uh, novelist, a, a social radical, uh, concern, uh, kind of a, a, a socialist. Um, but uh, but actually published some of his own work here in at his own home uh, on the on Fourth Avenue at one time. But uh, uh, Edward Chavans, who was a more conservative fellow, was uh, I think a little embarrassed about his stories of his uncle. But his uncle to this day still has a cult following, has a whole Wikipedia page. Uh, but uh, 
but we're talking about Ed Chavans. Uh, he was a uh, he's best known as a young man, as a even in, in school as a singer, uh, and people were just very impressed with his singing voice. And one of the people who was impressed with his singing voice when he was in his uh, 20s was a, uh, a singer named Grace Moore, who was from here, a very well-known uh, opera singer who was also in the movies. She, she sang at the Met, but she also was the first uh, to be nominated for an Oscar for a singing role in Hollywood. So she was uh, very well known in the early 1930s. And she introduced uh, Ed Chavans, uh, young Ed Chavans, to uh, Louis B. Mayer, uh, that, uh, and the, the famous uh, uh, producer, Hollywood producer, and uh, introduced them in New York. And, uh, and Chavans rode with Grace Moore and Louis B. Mayer in Mayer's Pullman coach all the way to Hollywood. And they got to know each other. Mayer liked him uh, and, uh, and thought there was a, a future for him in Hollywood. Uh, sent him into a bunch of auditions. Uh, he, he got a, a, enough to, made enough to live on while he was in Hollywood. But after about eight months, he decided he didn't like the life out there. And uh, rather than taking the Pullman coach back East, he thumbed his way back to Knoxville uh, after the end of, uh, of 1930. And, uh, and, and and went back into a more conservative profession. His family's lumber business uh, was, uh, he was uh, vice president by uh, the uh, late 1930s. Uh, he uh, worked uh, hard on the home front during the war effort, World War II effort, and uh, was, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was, was seemed to be content with his life. He was a golfer, pretty proud of his golfing. Uh, when, uh, when Kaz Walker was recalled, uh, uh, there was this, and he was concerned. He was on the pro recall uh, side. Uh, he said uh, he was asked if he would run against uh, Walker uh, as the as the fill-in candidate for the recall. He said, "I don't want the job, but somebody has to do it for the people," uh, and that was his his point of view. Um, hence, he was the only Knoxville mayor with showbiz experience, uh, and he had uh, he, he uh, actually the. He, he unseated the only Knoxville uh, mayor with showbiz experience and being the, the second Knoxville mayor with showbiz experience, very different kinds of showbiz. But, uh, but that, that, that seems like a weird irony to me that this guy who's a well-known singer uh, unseated the guy who was known for cultivating uh, uh, other singers, uh, later Dolly Parton, uh, Cass Walker's best known, uh, best claim to fame, I think, is Dolly Parton's success. Um, but anyway, he was, um, after he was mayor, uh, he uh, quit politics altogether before he was 40 years old. He didn't, just didn't like it any more than he liked Hollywood. And he lived a quiet life as a lumber executive, but he was best known as a competitive golfer. And you see him in the paper a lot as uh, winning golfing, golfing championships. <coughs> after Chavan's uh, uh, Knoxville, um, uh, not not Knoxville, Tennessee banned the uh, city manager style of uh, the mayor, city manager style of city government, and uh, we couldn't do that anymore here. So we just had the what they call the strong mayor. Uh, these were mayors directed directly by the people, who really did make the policy decisions themselves. And I mentioned there was another James Elmore after the one who was mayor briefly in the 1930s, and this is James Elmore Jr. He was actually more famous than his father. Uh, even before his father was mayor, because he was uh, he was a uh, one uh, he was uh, uh, Robert Nealon's coach Nealon's first quarterback back in the late 1920s, when the balls were just becoming famous. Um, but um, but anyway, he was uh, he followed his father by by seven mayor mayoral terms. His father was already dead by this time. But uh, during his time, he, he didn't uh, cause any big stirs as mayor. Didn't uh, have any major initiatives. Uh, except for uh, uh, UT Hospital was, was opening. That was mainly UT's business, but it, its opening took uh, the Knoxville General Hospital off of the city, uh, off of the city uh, uh, books. Uh, Knoxville General Hospital had been supported by the city and had been the public hospital for the city, but then UT became the, the public hospital after that. Uh, so this was actually something he was relieved of something, but but also Neal and Drive across across the river from UT Hospital was built during Elmore's time, and who knows if it would have been named Neal and Drive if not uh, if not Elmore uh, who had who had played football for Neal had uh, had uh, not been in charge. 
Uh, he retired uh, after a fairly non-eventful uh, term uh, to uh, run uh, an office supply business um, and uh, uh, did, uh, did, did fairly well at that, I think. The next mayor we'll talk about is a guy who was already well-known, already influential, already a major figure in City Hall, uh, uh, George Dempster. Uh, he had been a city manager uh, 20, more than 20 years before he was mayor. Um, so he knew his way around. He was a son of, uh, of immigrants from Scotland and Ireland. Uh, uh, he skipped college. It's, it's remarkable how many uh, mayors didn't, didn't make it to college. Uh, worked on the Panama Canal, went to work with his brother on the Panama Canal and learned quite a few things there. He came back to town and they ran a machine shop for a while. Dempster Brothers, uh, eventually George Dempster ran it by himself. He earned, uh, he was a very imaginative guy, uh, earned 25 patents. Uh, the best known of them, of course, is something called the dumpster. Uh, the Dempster dumpster was introduced to the world in, uh, in 1936. Uh, this was uh, the very first dumpster, very, rather small, uh, but this idea of a big bin that could be moved around by a truck with hooks specially fitted for it was introduced. And in, during this time of year, right before Christmas in 1936, uh, when uh, he just put out four of them in, in the alley between Gay Street and Market Street and uh, began uh, this, this, uh, this, this, this amazing uh, new, new device. I understand there, there are, uh, people are playing them as musical instruments in Austin, Texas now, but there, it's, uh, it's, uh, if you see a dumpster anywhere in the world, it's something that was first introduced by, by George Dempster in 1936. Um, he had been city manager for six years in the 30s. Uh, we mentioned the Henley Bridge earlier was was uh, was one of his big projects and named for him. Also, the airport back in the 1930s in Blount County, he did a lot to make that happen. Uh, he was uh, so respected that he had and had so many ideas uh, uh, that uh, he, he was invited to write a, a column for the Knoxville Journal. And it was called uh, appropriate like, like it or not. It sounds like a realist uh, column. Like it or not was the name of George Dempster's column. Um, but uh, during while he was mayor in the early 50s, he uh, he oversaw the construction of a new sewage system in the city, uh, which was uh, which was a, a major uh, a major uh, innovation. Uh, at, at that before the 1950s, a lot of sewage was getting into the river without any uh, without any treatment. Uh, but uh, he also began reimagining Market Square as an open space. Whether this was a good idea or not, uh, he wanted to tear down that old market house. Uh, he thought uh, he thought it was an eyesore. Um, but that was he began the the ball rolling that did uh, eventually dispense with the market house. Um, but uh, he was he showed uh, I think showed uh, uh, his true colors in the in the final years of his life. In 1960, he was a very old man. Uh, was uh, uh, was the city was facing a, a new kind of a crisis? It was desegregation, and all these uh, the restaurant people of uh, of downtown. Uh, it was during the uh, uh, the sit-ins. They were saying, uh, "What should we do, uh, Mr. Dempster? All these all these black people are coming in and sitting on our counter. I, we don't know what to do about it." And he said, "I can answer that in three words." He said, "Let them eat." But uh, I think uh, George Dempster may have uh, gone a long way in, in helping in Knoxville cross the uh, line of desegregation more peacefully than, than some other uh, uh, segregated cities. Uh, the next one we'll talk about is uh, another guy that, uh, that, uh, that I don't think he, he didn't uh, go to college either. He was a machinist he, uh, his named Jack Dance, a machinist. He was a military mechanic in World War I, was uh, specialized actually in working on uh, on British planes and in, in, in uh, Europe, uh, but came back to run a dry cleaning business in Knoxville and did that for some years. Uh, was uh, a likable guy, but everybody had something nice to say about Jack Dance. He was county clerk for 13 years. Uh, was uh, became a mayor and uh, during uh, was elected mayor was uh, it was during uh, the urban renewal era and he oversaw a lot of what happened uh, uh, during the urban renewal. Uh, the fir very first part of the urban renewal period uh, when they were tearing down lots of, of places and building and beginning to build something uh, that was uh, known as the Civic Coliseum. He, he didn't uh, live to see it happen. Uh, he was the last mayor, uh, uh, at least, uh, and I hope the last mayor ever, uh, to die in office. I think he was the third or so in, in Knoxville history. 
But here's a picture of the, the Coliseum as it was finally uh, built, uh, finished after about two years after his, his death and was a, a big success as an unsegregated place, by the way. It was, uh, it was uh, one, of the, one of the few buildings of that era that was never segregated. At the time they built the, the uh, Coliseum, the movie theaters in Oxford were still were still whites only, basically, except for the the gym, but um, and the uh, the BG, which had a area uh, for for black people on the second balcony. But uh, but anyway, he he uh, he had a heart attack and at age sixty one, uh, uh, and uh, and and died in office uh, completely unexpectedly. And uh, and yes, who was mayor next, uh, that was a guy uh, who'd been mayor before named Kaz Walker. <laughs> Kaz Walker had been, uh, had been, uh, had been mayor uh, before back in the 1940s, and he was acting mayor uh, for 11 weeks until they elected a, a, a special election, hastily organized, uh, elected a, an emergency, had an emergency election, uh, elected the guy who'd been Jack Dance's law director, and that is uh, John Duncan, John J. Duncan um, of Huntsville, Tennessee, originally in Scott County. He was a UT grad. He was uh, uh, a, a, a became assistant attorney general, um, and uh, he kind of uh, was a very conservative fellow uh, from Scott County, very Republican. And when Charlie Chaplin was suspected of uh, communist sympathies, he he uh, kind of leaned on UT to to not show not to cancel a planned uh, showing of Charlie Chaplin movies in the early 1950s. So it was a different different times, of course. But uh, but he uh, became a, a a president of Home Federal Bank. Uh, was uh, uh, much much respected for his honesty. Uh, uh, regardless of whether you uh, agreed with his uh, with his uh, uh, points of view on everything, um, but uh, was uh, uh, was was um, law director for, uh, for for Jack Dance was uh, uh, was elected mayor was the uh, the during his uh, his term in office 18, 1959 to sixty four uh, after. Dempster's dream of tearing down the market house actually happened. Uh, it was Mayor Duncan that saw the construction of Market Square Mall. They called it, and that was that was the this kind of brand modern take on a pedestrian square, and, which was actually surprisingly a lot of people make fun of Market Square Mall. But in the early years, it was much respected. It, people as far, from as far away as Australia came to look in, at this wonderful place, uh, Market Square Mall, and, and wrote about it and how well this is working. But also uh, the fact that Nas Wonder went very peaceful desegregation during this time. Uh, Duncan uh, set up something he called the Goodwill Committee, and this was a committee with both black and white city leaders uh, to try to work things out and, and avoid the kind of, of violence that was going on in the Deep South. Um, a good idea, I think. He left uh, as mayor. He was he was uh, elected in the emergency uh, uh, election, and then had a regular election was was reelected. Uh, but, but left to, uh, to go to Congress uh, when he ran to hold, when, when actually another death in office, when Howard Baker Sr. died in office, uh, he was a congressman, uh, Howard Baker Jr.'s father, of course, uh, also from the same town that John Duncan was from. Uh, he thought, this is my chance to be a congressman. And he, he uh, was elected to Congress and, uh, and held that role for many, many years. I think he was in Congress for 20, 25 years or so. And of course, it was his son that we remember, uh, Jimmy Duncan, um, who was uh, uh, who was a, who, who he kept kept going. But we had a John Duncan, John J James Duncan, in in office for uh, decades and decades. I can't remember how many years. But uh, anyway, uh, but he when he left, we had another emergency uh, election, and we uh, the uh, actually the city council I think picked this guy Robert Crosley. To be mayor, uh, he was elected. He was a uh, elected to replace Duncan. He really was only mayor for one month, and but it happened to be the month, uh, the last weeks of 1964 and first weeks of 1965. So the the biggest thing he got done was celebrating Christmas of 1964, I think, as, on behalf of the city. But his uh, the the guy that was that was being elected in the, in the regular election after that was uh, Leonard Rogers, who was finally inaugurated. Already, already been elected was was being inaugurated um, in uh, in 1965, 
Uh, Leonard Rogers was uh, uh, not from East Tennessee, but was from Memphis. He came to uh, UT in 1930 and stayed. This happened, uh, it, it's interesting how many mayors or people who came to Knoxville just figuring out go, going to school at UT and end up staying and be, being uh, community leaders. Uh, because he was knowledgeable about architecture, uh, he became a leader of the Tennessee Valley Fair and uh, was uh, one of the major movers and shakers there for many years as, uh, as the fair, uh, as we know it, evolved. Um, he was appointed to, to council when a member on council died um, and soon uh, got the, the political bug, ran for mayor, um, and was, was pretty, pretty well liked. He was uh, kind of old school in some ways, but he... Uh, but he built, uh, planned and built something called the Safety Building, which we uh, still have today. I think it's finally come to a, 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 the end of its original purpose, but it's, uh, but that was something that he built, this very modern building on the east side of town. His uh, successor was a guy that uh, many people remember personally. I, I got to know him a little bit, uh, Kyle Testerman. Um, he was uh, the first uh, mayor to serve non-consecutive terms uh, since uh, Sam High School. He was a, in his early days, he, his, his name appears a lot in the newspaper, but I would say the first hundred times you see Kyle Tessman's name in the newspapers, it's he's, it's for his, uh, his, uh, his talents on the tennis court. He was a tennis champion and remained so uh, for, for many years, even when he was getting into politics. Uh, but uh, he was uh, a young, vigorous guy when he was elected mayor in 1971. People, I think, want, people some, wanted somebody new, young, vigorous, uh, and athletic, sophisticated, uh, aggressive. Uh, but he uh, kind of uh, uh, helped push through liquor by the drink. We had, until Testerman was mayor, it was illegal to serve a glass of wine in a restaurant uh, in Knoxville. Uh, you could buy a bottle of wine in a liquor store, but you couldn't serve a glass of wine in a, in a, in a restaurant. And uh, Testerman, with, uh, with uh, the, the help of uh, the people who voted uh, for the subject, uh, uh, helped change that. Um, he also was, uh, was the guy that, that uh, planned uh, Summit Hill Drive, which is right out my window here. Summit Hill Drive, which he was being built about the same time that TVA was building his big giant headquarters at the north end of Market Square. He wanted something to, to go right by TVA and show everybody in the world that came through Knoxville, the TVA was here in Knoxville. This was the headquarters of TVA. But he also uh, helped organize the first bike trail, helped uh, get that going through the city. Uh, that, of course, the very first one was the Third Creek Trail, which went uh, west of uh, Tyson Park. Uh, this was a whole crazy new idea at the time. And he also proposed another crazy new idea, and that was a World's Fair. Uh, who would have thought that Knoxville would ever host a World's Fair? Uh, Testerman was the guy that kind of got the idea rolling. I, I'm not sure if it was originally his personal idea, but he really was the, the guy that, that took it and said, this is realistic, let's make it happen. Um, he uh, was, uh, uh, was, was not in office when the World's Fair happened, but it was, it, it was during his administration that they, they said, we're gonna have a World's Fair and it's gonna be like in the, in the Second Creek Valley and, and there are certain things that have to happen to make that come about. And that mostly happened because of uh, his successor. Uh, uh, but I'll, 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 mention, uh, I'll mention his second term in office. After eight years out of office, he uh, returned and was a, was a great supporter of the old city. Um, and I want to mention that his daughter, Janet, uh, was elected to city council just uh, last year exactly 50 years after her father was elected to city council. So that's uh, quite a, an interesting uh, uh, fact there. But, uh, uh, but anyway, he was, he, uh, he was uh, succeeded in, after his first term by a guy named Randy Tyree, uh, who uh, is, still lives in town. Uh, he's from uh, Lebanon, Tennessee, and was a big supporter of Mayor Rogers, uh, was a, a close ally of Mayor Rogers. In fact, uh, uh, was a, a policeman, uh, in, um, in, in, and I think the only policeman who became mayor of Knoxville. But he uh, became Rogers' uh, safety director uh, during the Rogers administration, and uh, and ran against Testerman and won at age 35. Uh, and was uh, Testerman was young, but Tyree was even younger. A lot of people thought that Tyree was the youngest mayor in Knoxville history. Uh, he was not, but he was the youngest in the 20th, 20th century. Uh, we had several in the 19th century, century who, were, who were in their late 20s or early 30s. 
but Tyree was only 35 years old, very vigorous, and, and was, uh, I think, a NAFT representative of Knoxville with the idea of the World's Fair, and it was Tyree that kind of, kind of made this, uh, made this thing uh, actually happen. He, he presided over it when it, when it did happen. He was the, the mayor of Knoxville during uh, the fair in 1982. Uh, and during uh, during 1982, also uh, he, he was uh, impressed so many people that he became Democratic nominee for governor. Uh, he didn't win, but uh, he returned to private practice and occasionally ran for another office or two. He ran for sheriff a couple times, but was uh, mainly a, a, a downtown lawyer. And and I still see him around at events uh, uh, these days. But uh, the the next guy is a guy who sometimes uh, joined us uh, for. Uh, for uh, uh, these Zoom presentations. I don't know if he's here tonight or not, but uh, Victor Ash. Uh, Victor Ash is the uh, uh, Yale uh, grad, uh, had known uh, George W. Bush there, uh, was in state legislature when he was only 23 years old, was elected to the state Senate before he could legally hold office and his mother held office in his stead until he was 30 years old and, uh, and could fill in for himself. But he uh, became mayor of Knoxville in the, in 1987 and was our longest term mayor in history. You know, he ran, uh, served four terms, was elected to four terms in office, 16 years in all. Um, and that is is likely to, that record is safe as long as we have term limits because they didn't have term limits when he was there. But it kind of raises a question about term limits because most people agree that his third and fourth terms, which would be illegal now, were, uh, were his most vigorous and, and when he got the most things done. He, he got the volunteer landing going, uh, lots and lots of greenways, not just one short little bike trail anymore, lots and lots of greenways all over town. They'll be remembered for that, but also the Market Square Rehabilitation Project uh, began under his uh, under his uh, career. I think really downtown revival, the whole, the whole idea of pilots and TIFs, things like this to, to support uh, mixed use residential development and other things like this downtown uh, started under Ash's administration. Uh, of course, Bill Haslam followed him, a uh, guy that a lot of people weren't sure, weren't sure was ready for administration. It's surprising to remember when he first ran for mayor, they said, what is this kid got? He's just worked for his dad at Pilot and he worked for Saks Fifth Avenue in New York for a couple of years, but what has he done in terms of public administration? He, he, was, he was known for charity work, he'd work for United Way and things like that and leadership roles, but, but people were, were, were skeptical about him when he was first elected in, in 2003, he ran against Malvin O'Hara and very narrowly won. Um, and Malvin O'Hara was considered the more progressive of the two candidates, but I think he, he uh, surprised a lot of people both with his ambitious and well thought out plans, but also with the fact that he was not uh, just a, 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 a lackey for the uh, conservative uh, uh, parts of the, the uh, community. He uh, had lots of ambitious plans for uh, 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 the South Side uh, that he announced that are still in the works. Um, uh, he, he launched the, uh, the he, he made sure the Regal Riviera would open the, the, this movie theater downtown, uh, partly with his own with his own investment, uh, made it happen. Uh, uh, Cineplex downtown when when uh, when it when, when Regal thought it was impossible, um, he he kind of made it made it possible. Uh, but the Hunter Block of Gay Street uh, is uh, is is much improved. Was completely torn up and rebuilt uh, uh, in a great degree during Haslam's time. And came up with this crazy idea for Cumberland Avenue, which had been uh, had been kind of blighted for some time. This idea that Cumberland Avenue, if you made it more pedestrian accessible and put a median in and things like this and kind of slowed the traffic down through Cumberland Avenue, that this would be good for things. And I think the results are mixed, but kind of hopeful uh, for Cumberland Avenue in the future. There's, it, it looks uh, somewhat better than it did uh, 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 10 years ago. And I, I hope it will get better still. Um, but uh, it surprised a lot of people when he hired his former opponent. I don't know how often this happens that a mayor hires the, the person that he beat uh, to get to the office, but he hired Malvern O'Hara to be uh, his director of community development. And uh, she became a, a very closely associated with his, his vision. Uh, he, when Haslam left early to run for higher office as Duncan had, uh, uh, and, and he was elected governor, uh, we had uh, a interim uh, mayor elected by city council. And that was Dan Brown, who was a city councilman, a guy who was a Vietnam veteran 
had worked in Nashville as a pharmacy technician uh, and returned to Knoxville to work, work at the post office for some time. I was elected to state council, uh, very popular, and became our first black mayor uh, and served for 11 months in that role uh, until uh, he, he declined to run for uh, a regular election office. Uh, it was some people were encouraging him to do that, but he did not choose to to do that. Uh, but Mountain Rohiro, who had been uh, who had who had been uh, Haslam's uh, uh, community development director, uh, ran for mayor and became uh, became our first female mayor. Um, she had uh, was kind of an unlikely person to have been female mayor of Knoxville, not uh, to become mayor of Knoxville. Uh, because she had been a labor leader. She worked for Cesar Chavez uh, out, out west, had, uh, uh, had come to Knoxville only because only for the UT Graduate School of Planning, which is, um, sorry to say, not there anymore. Uh, she served on, on county commission, was very impressive uh, for her, her preparation and, and, and strong voice. Uh, she, she, uh, she actually was, had, was not just the first female mayor, she was several first, first female, first Latino mayor, and first mayor not born in Tennessee in about 70 years. She had lived in uh, Ohio and Florida before she came to, uh, to uh, Knoxville. Um, but she was known for her green initiatives, even was on one of Obama's uh, uh, councils for that, in that regard, was, uh, uh, was uh, carried out a lot of Haslam's initiatives on Cumberland Abbey. She, she did the hard work for and the South Side, when the South Side began to bloom, this, this dream that Haslam had 20 years ago was just starting to show fruit along Syria Avenue. If you haven't been out there lately, it's a, it's a, it's a lively place now with several new businesses along Severe Avenue and also Sutry Landing Park and uh, uh, with the beginning of development along Severe and Sutry Landing as well as a lot of the new greenways in the South Side. But uh, anyway, that is my reduced Shakespeare Company version of, <laughs> of these mayors. Uh, Paul was trying to talk me into doing uh, just a few of them. And, uh, and I said, well, they're all interesting in their own way. Let's try to see if we can get through all of them uh, tonight. And that's uh, that's what we've done. If there are uh, if there are uh, uh, questions, I see there are lots of chats, but uh, questions or comments uh, or mayors out there tonight. Uh, we've had two uh, former mayors on these Zoom meetings in the past. I don't know if there are any there tonight or not. Yeah, we do have one but, from Jackie Willard, and that was was George Dempster involved in promoting boxing. Boxing, mm. boxing. Obviously. Uh, O'Connor was, but um, yeah, yeah. involved in boxing. I don't know right off, offhand. I, 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 uh, he, he got in. He, he was a an informal boxer. He once boxed at a an unplanned boxing fight with David Chapman uh, and uh, over <laughs> a, a, an issue having to do with the Smoky Mountains. That's Actually, right. Knocked, it was, wasn't it? Knocked yeah. out some teeth, as I recall. So he Chapman came out the worst. Yeah, certainly. But uh, yeah, that was. Uh, that was a, a complicated early episode in the history of the Smoky Mountains uh, uh, movement. Uh, Chapman, who of course is a you know, legendary figure now, but uh, but he and he and Dempster just did not get along. But uh, any other questions? Chat comments. I agree with almost all of them. I should have mentioned uh, 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 Testerman and the garbage strike uh, when he actually worked as a garbage man for a while. Um, and uh, the Duncans were involved in baseball, both father and son. Um, I think Jimmy was uh, was a bat boy for a while. And uh, yeah, appreciate everybody's everybody's thoughts. And uh, talking about Martin Luther Luther King, um, actually, uh, Martin Luther King did come to Knoxville in 1960 uh, and uh, spoke at. Uh, Knoxville College, uh, and it was just barely covered in the papers. It was just a very small item, uh, and uh, but he, he drew several thousand uh, people to the big lawn at uh, at Knoxville College. And uh, uh, Bob Booker was there, and and hates that he he had a reel to reel tape recorder and recorded the speech, and then uh, misplaced it. So uh, I, we don't have any copy of the speech anywhere. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out. This was a kind of a, a heavy lift to try to get through 30, 31 mayors in uh, in one uh, one hour. So I, I appreciate everybody indulging me. And, uh...